Good evening, everybody. Evening. Isn't it nice to be back live in person? This, uh, for those, I can't see any of you right now, so for those of you who don't know me, I'm Alex Nardis, the director of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, and um, you know, it's been a long 18, thank you, long 18, 19 months. Um, I was on this stage just a couple of nights ago. We had the uh, uh, Sylvain Cordier, our Mellon uh, head of European art, do a lecture for that. Tonight, we are online. In fact, we have a much larger audience online. You know, before the pandemic, we did lots of online programs. Of course, we have a whole distance learning program that goes to schools all across Virginia, and online programs that, quite frankly, nobody took part of. And we have gone from virtually no audience, and we're talking 50, 60,000 people a year, which is tiny on the online presence, to something north of uh, about 800,000 people participating on various things. And tonight, crazy numbers again. Um, I want to thank our sponsors for tonight's event, this, this lecture and program. Uh, Peter and Kim Marsha are with us from You Decide. Thank you very much for your support. Glad you all could be here tonight in person. And among the people in the online audience are two folks I want to uh, welcome and in one case actually say thank you and goodbye. Welcoming is Sarah Kennel, who is our new curator, the Aaron Siskin Curator of Photography. Uh, she just joined us about two months ago, so we have uh, that much more uh, emphasis on photography. Not that we don't already have enough. You know, we've got Ansel Adams, if you haven't seen it, that Chris Oliver, our American, one of our American curators did, absolutely beautiful show. And of course, I'll get to Michael and this amazing exhibition uh, with Man Ray. But we also have a goodbye because today was the last day. In fact, it's, it's hard to imagine that at five o'clock, Stephen Bonadies, who was our senior deputy director. Yeah, please give Stephen a, a round of applause. Thank you, Stephen. 13 years as our chief conservator and our deputy director uh, and earlier this year. Uh, and of course, like many people, the pandemic has changed our frame of reference. Uh, I was surprised but not surprised that Stephen said he was planning to retire. And his, his uh, effort was simply motivated by wanting to be able to enjoy life without, and for those of you who, um, would love to be in the art museum world. I would encourage you to do it, but expect it to be much like we are. Open 365 days a year and most nights too. And that's the kind of experience that Stephen has lived through. Uh, I have a fabulous uh, career, 13 years here as our uh, senior deputy director for conservation and collections, but then 27 years as deputy director at the Cincinnati Art Museum before we could lure him here. So uh, to both of them, welcome and, and goodbye. But Stephen isn't going far, folks, so don't, don't worry too much. Um, we will uh, be seeing a lot of him. Tonight, um, the pandemic played into this evening and into this exhibition. Because when the pandemic hit and we were forced to close, unthinkable for an institution, the only one, open with free general admission, 365 days a year, and we closed for three and a half months. So in doing that, we had exhibitions fall by the wayside. We had this great exhibition, I hate to even tell you about, uh, paintings from the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. Yeah, I know. Well, you're gonna just have to go to Florence instead, okay? Just a minor detail, they serve really good Italian food in Florence too. Um, but because of that, and, and it literally fell apart at the same time, our Mellon collection of French paintings were in Padua, and they barely made it out of the country in that second week of March of last year. But our collections people worked extra hard. The flights had been canceled. They got the trucks to Milan. They were able to extract it. Not so lucky with the Uffizi. So we juggled things around. Michael Taylor was working on an exhibition and I'll take you back six years ago when Michael came to the museum. Prior to coming here, he was the director of the Hood Museum at Dartmouth College. 
Prior to that, he spent 14, 15 years at the Philadelphia Museum of Art, where he was the head of modern and contemporary art. He's a specialist in Dada and Surrealism, uh, Duchamp, uh, and obviously Man Ray. So our curators were all charged with the task that they had to be working on a major exhibition. It had to result in a book-length publication that added measurably to their respective field of art history. And no one was exempt. So Michael said, just so you know, I'm working on one too, Man Ray Photography. And of course, if you haven't seen the exhibition yet, you'll understand with his background in surrealism and Dada and all of, all of the early 20th century movements, how important this all fits in and what a seminal character Man Ray becomes in Paris during those, those crazy years. What he didn't expect was that we were gonna have a pandemic and this exhibition that was planned for like 2075 or something <laughs> way down the road in the future. You know, he's got a day job. Deputy director for, for exhibitions, education, curatorial, statewide. I mean, an amazingly large job. But in his time here, he's already written three other books, including one on photography, and has been extremely busy. So he stepped up the pace and was able to put together an unbelievable exhibition on one of the most important artists and photographers of the 20th century. And didn't just do that, but this is also the first exhibition that we've ever had on view where we have two languages for our labels and for our audio guides. We have English and Spanish, because I think as everybody knows, <laughs> the, the Hispanic population in Virginia has been blossoming into large numbers, in not just in the Richmond region, but, but all across the Commonwealth. And obviously that's very important because for us accessibility means accessibility on every level. And whether it's, that's intellectual or physical or anything else, uh, we strive to try to find ways to make those things happen. So Michael uh, works on this exhibition and of course the, the pandemic gave us all some time uh, uh, at home, uh, unfortunately, when we were closed, and he was able to put together what is, is, is absolutely a stunning exhibition and a major publication that I guarantee you will be on the shelves of every photo historian, every modernist, not just in this country, but across the world. It's that good of a book. So uh, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Michael Taylor, our Deputy Director and Chief Curator. Well, good evening, everyone. It's great to be here tonight. Um, this was, I, I, I've said before, it wasn't a labor of love. This was a truly a joy to work on during the pandemic. And I'm not sure if I would have been able to write a book like this, which is, you can do your weight training, it's so heavy, <laughs> had it not been for the, the museum's closure. And we hadn't quite figured out Zoom yet. So there was this brief moment when <laughs> we, we, were, we were on the phone a lot, but there was also a lot of time. And I have to say, my writing partner was uh, our dog, Daisy, who's a golden doodle, who, who was so perplexed that we were all at home. Because normally, when we, when we leave, the kids go to school, my wife and I go to work, Daisy goes to sleep. And we know that because she has bedhead when we come home. <laughs> and she never had so many walks. So she would, she would literally lie on the bed looking at me like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I got up early and I would just hammer away and, and it, it was a joy. So we're gonna begin tonight by looking at Man Ray the Parish Years. It's an exhibition that deals with his first Paris period, which was between 1921 and 1940. Man Ray was born Emmanuel Radnitsky in Philadelphia. He was the son of Russian Jewish immigrants 
And at school, they called him Manny. So Emmanuel became Manny, became man. Radnitsky contracted to Ray. And then you had Man Ray, one of the great artist names. We know there's Leonardo, there's Raphael, and there's Man Ray. He, he could have been a Ninja Turtle. Um, <laughs> So I want to mention someone who, who worked so hard with me on this project, and that's Madeline Dugan, who is a student at Virginia Commonwealth University. And as Alex said, when, when we suddenly realized that we were going to fast track this, we needed to have support. And Madeline came on board and, and has been with me every step of the way. I really believe in mentoring. And Madeline brings so much energy, so much excitement to this project. She's been a great partner. And one of the, the, the kind of epiphanies that we had together was this photograph. Because what you realize is it's a self-portrait, but that camera, that Zeiss Icon ICA reflex camera, model 7561, which we identified, um, that camera is taking your portrait. It's not taking Man Ray's portrait. There's another camera hidden from view that's doing that. So it start, we started to think about this as a show that wasn't just about Man Ray and his innovations and his techniques. Um, that story has largely been told, um, even though we did do ridiculous amounts of research and, and redated photographs, retitled photographs. But the large picture there had, had been done, and, and done by a slew of really great scholars over the years. But we started to think about his models, and his sitters, and his subjects. And what we realized is they were part of the creative act too. They were not blocks of marble or lumps of clay to be coerced and shaped and played with. In other words, they, when they came to Man Ray's studio for their portrait, they were self-fashioning too. They had an idea of how they saw themselves and how they wanted to project to the world. And I think that sort of relationship between Man Ray, the radically innovative photographer, and his subjects, who are themselves often changing their names, changing their identities, that was really what this show became about. So here, I think this comparison is very instructive. So this is Berenice Abbott. Now, we know her today as a great American photographer. She started out as a sculptor, and her name was Bernice Abbott. The Berenice was actually a, a suggestion of Jean Cocteau, who's someone you will meet in a minute. So this photograph uh, on the far screen, the 1921, it's called Portrait of a Sculptor, because that's what that's who she was at that time, was something that Man Ray showed Alfred Stieglitz before he went to Paris. And you have to remember, Man Ray was a painter. He was trained as a painter. Uh, he was a modernist. He, he was struck by the Armory show. And he was an artist who worked in a very avant-garde way on canvas. Um, you know, he, he kind of filters his work through the lens of cubism and Dada, and he really, up until this point, uh, thinks of photography as recording his paintings as they leave the studio. But this photograph changes things for him, because Stieglitz admires it, and he says, you know what, you should enter that into a photography competition that's taking place in Philadelphia at the John Wanamaker department store. And Man Ray does, and he wins a $10 prize. <laughs> and I think a light bulb went off in his head. I think he thought, you know what? This could be a game changer. This could be a way of getting income. I think at that time he still thought he would be a painter, but maybe photography could be a supplementary income. Then you go forward a year, and Bernie Sabat moved to Paris shortly before Man Ray, literally within a, a months of each other. And they reconnect in Paris, and Man Ray takes this photograph, and it's night and day. Uh, it's probably his first major photograph in Paris. I think he'd just bought a camera. I think he's testing out a lens, and she is sitting on the trunk 
in his hotel room. So in other words, he's still not unpacked. This is a very early moment. We know that he arrives in Paris in July 1921. And I think something went wrong. I, I, I don't think he intended her to look like that. I think he, he clicked the, cat, the, the shutter and it captured something marvelous. And that's what I love about Man Ray. The chance, the accident, he embraced that. He didn't say, oh my God, I've made a mistake. He said, wow, this is a new way of making a, a photograph. And so the portrait of a sculptor, I think, can be readily put into a, a history of photography around the photo secession, around pictorialism. It's, it's kind of, it, it's softened. It, 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 it's got a, a, a feel that you look at it and you could place that alongside works by Steichen and Stieglitz and it would be happily at home. This portrait is unlike anything anyone has done to this point. I love the way she kind of cups herself and has those elfin features and those big eyes. And it's like she emerges from the bottom of the screen. And then all that blank space, that's what's radical, that's what's new. So there's a difference between what he was doing in New York and Paris. In New York, he was primarily a painter who made photographs, usually to document his work. In Paris, it's actually gone the other way. He makes far more photographs than he does paintings. Um, so now we situate him in Paris. Remember, he doesn't speak French. He, he is literally fresh off the boat. He has to meet people. He has to establish a network. And I think one of the most important connections he makes is with Gertrude Stein, the great modernist writer. Stein is someone who is really the doyen of the American expatriate community. She lives with Alice B. Toklas, uh, her partner, and their apartment, which you can see, is filled with modern paintings by Cezanne and Picasso and Wong Gri. They have a Saturday evening salon, and it's there that Man Ray can meet his fellow expatriates. So I think that was a very important formative moment for him, was to find a patron in Stein. And Stein won the lottery because she basically realizes that Man Ray is a great photographer who can take images of her that are unlike any other, others that have been taken. And they enter in, into a relationship where, uh, much to Man Ray's chagrin, she doesn't actually pay him. <laughs> <laughs> but he gets to keep, obviously, the negatives. And so, you know, you, you have this situation where even though she, she hasn't paid him for making a portrait like this, he can send it to New York and it's reproduced in Vanity Fair. So he gets paid for that. But by the uh, end of the 1920s, in fact, in 1930, Manry's getting a bit tired of this and he sends her an invoice. And, uh, <laughs> and I love the fact that she said, my dear Man Ray, we are all hard up, but let's not be silly about it. <laughs> she never paid the invoice, they never spoke again, but she did keep his photographs and she used them again and again. And if you look at the, the uh, autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, which is arguably her greatest work, there's Man Ray's portrait on the cover. And so Stein is really important in this story as being that great introducer and allowing Man Ray to suddenly have a community and a community of writers and artists that, that he can call his friends. Which brings me to Hemingway. I love this portrait. So Hemingway, you know, is so macho. He's, he's going to bullfighting, he's fighting in wars. And in this portrait, he has this, this bandage on his head. But that didn't come from a bullfight or, or, or a battle. It, it came because he was at a party at Man Ray studio, slightly drunk. And he goes to the bathroom, and he goes to pull the chain. But it wasn't the toilet chain. It was the casement window. And it comes crashing on his head. And he's, he's got all these glass splinters, and so there's there's blood everywhere. 
Man Ray patches him up. He puts this adorable felt hat on his head. And I love this amazing telegram that Ezra Pound sends to Hemingway. And you've got to kind of, I, I'm, I was born in Britain, so, so my British accent is going to murder this. But think of a Yankee kind of, this is what Pound is trying to get into. Like, how the hell suffering Tomcats did you get drunk enough to fall upwards through the blithering skylight? <laughs> I just love it. So I think Stein, Stein allows Man Ray to meet fellow Americans, but Cocteau introduces him to the international avant-garde. And Jean Cocteau was a, a polymath. He, he was not someone who saw a hierarchy of the arts. He was a, a, a painter, a poet, a, a playwright, a musician, a composer. There was almost nothing he couldn't do. And he could try different things on different days and, and be really good at them. And what that meant was he had an a unbelievable network. Uh, he was also openly gay, and he lived life to the full. You can see he was this incredible dandy. I would love to own that cane with that amazing Derby handle that just keeps going. And so Cocteau... Uh, loves Man Ray's portraits. He, 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 sits for the, he sits for his own portrait and is so impressed that he decides to be Man Ray's, you know, agent, his advocate. Uh, he actually writes him an open letter that he publishes in a French journal praising his photography. And so through Cocteau, Man Ray gets in, into a, an, a really important, rich seam of, of clientele. I want to mention this other photograph. This, this might be the surprise photograph of the show. Uh, so one day, uh, Cocteau was visiting Picasso, and, he, and Picasso lived in this apartment building. You had to get the elevator to the top floor. And Cocteau was high on hashish and opium. And I think we've all done that. We've gone in these elevators. <laughs> high as a kite. And, and you see a vision, and, and the vision that Cocteau had, there, there was, he really thought he was seeing like some kind of ghost. And the, the, the character, the, the, the kind of apparition he saw says to him, my name is on the plate. Well, what that means, they're in an elevator, and the name on the plate is the manufacturer, and it was the French equivalent of Otis Elevators. <laughs> Now, Cocteau, in his really kind of drug-addled state, reads that as, as her to beast, and he freaks out. He, just, he can't go see Picasso. He, he goes home, and he stays up for the next three days writing a poem about what he had seen. And what he decides in the end was that it was an angel, and it was actually a, a, a kind of reincarnation uh, of a man called Raymond Radiguet, who had been his lover, who had died of tuberculosis. And so he has, he, he kind of, it's almost like a, a post-traumatic thing, like he, he's, he does self-therapy in order to understand what happens. Now, what has this got to do with Man Ray? Well, when he publishes this book in 1925, he says to Man Ray, I need a photograph for the frontispiece. Man Ray gives him this, and... This is not meant to be an image of, of, of an angel. I, this is very clearly what we call a rayograph. Um, it, it's basically a form of cameraless photography where Man Ray has put objects, and, and you can see there's kind of a wine glass and a funnel and possibly some ribbons. He's put them on photosensitive paper and exposed them to light, and he's made a composition. But when it was published, the uh, publisher... Uh, library stock decides to, to tagline it. The caption is Portrait of the Angel. And I like that because it puts Man Ray suddenly into the realm of spirit photography. You know, the 19th century, you had all of these kind of like amazing images where, where artists were capturing spirits. Um, so we, we had to have it in the show. And then uh, other people that Cocteau introduced him to are, are, are really associated with 
entities like the, the Ballet Russe. Here you see Serge Lafarge. Uh, he, this is really something that would have been made for a, a theater program. Uh, the, the, the Ballet Barabao, which um, debuted in London. Uh, this is Lafarge basically wearing a uniform that's designed by Maurice Utrio and he's brandishing that whip in a really jaunty way. So this is like a publicity image. The one next to it is Stravinsky, the great Russian composer. And I love this because again, we're back to Berenice Abbott sitting on that trunk and something going slightly wrong. I think what's happened is Igor Stravinsky is sitting in a chair and he's heard a noise and he's like whipped around. What was that? And you can kind of tell that because his hand is blurred. There's, there's like a motion here. But what I love about this photograph is he's not wearing any socks. <laughs> so he has shown up into this, into Man Ray Studio with a very wonderful kind of like wool suit. Um, but he doesn't have to wear socks because no one's gonna see them because the photograph's <laughs> gonna be on the top of his body. But what I love about this, these were all modernists. These, these were all people who, who were creative, cultural luminaries. So Stravinsky loved this portrait, and why not? And by the way, I, I think you have to understand where these photographs are taking place, at least in, in the 1920s and early 30s. So this is Man Ray's studio, and here's the stairs. Now, Kiki de Montparnasse, who you will meet shortly, she lived upstairs. Man Ray's partner. And she was always banging around, and we know that from Man Ray's autobiography, Self-Portrait, that he was always hearing these noises. So that's probably what Stravinsky heard. Um, and you would sit here, and what you would have, look at Havelock Ellis, you, you would often have a kind of curtain or, or burlap or even a painting. Um, take note of this painting. It's called tapestry painting. It's now lost, but it was enormous. Uh, Man Ray, again, I told you, he recorded his, his paintings, and those index cards are now at the Pompidou in Paris. We know that this was nine feet tall, and it's unstretched. And so when you look at Pascan, that is the tapestry painting upside down and reversed. And it took us a long, long time. Uh, and I have to credit my, my friend Francis Nauman for helping to figure that one out. Um, but I love that because what it gives is a specificity. And once you get deep in Man Ray, you are looking at chairs. You, you, you know, you're really trying to ascertain where is this taking place. And then Barbette. Barbette is, is you know, just one of the... <laughs> the amazing series of photographs that Man Ray makes. Barbette was Cocteau's lover. Uh, she was a he. Uh, Barbette was born Van der Clyde Broadway in Round Rock, Texas, and was an aerialist, like a trapeze artist. And in America, her act was, was met with howls of derision and, and homophobia. But in Paris, people love Barbette. Barbette becomes an icon, almost akin to Josephine Baker. And Cocteau wanted to write an extended essay on Barbette and her transformation that happened in the dressing room. And I think you see it in these two photographs. The, the one nearest me is really when the transformation is complete. And you are really hard pressed to know that that is, is a man and not a woman. So what happens with Barbette is in the act, so, so you see Barbette performing the, these aerial feats, and then right at the end, Barbette takes the wig off and suddenly starts to roll muscles. Like you see that this is actually, you know, this big guy. And what Cocteau pointed out is the illusion was almost akin to having chalk or dust thrown in your eyes, like powder. So you, you were blinded. You should have been able to see this, but you were blinded. And I think that, that reference to chalk and powder is a reference both to Barbette's makeup, 
Um, but also the chalk that, that an aerialist holds onto when they're flying on the bars. So these are beautiful, tender portraits. And on January 23rd, we're going to have a, a Barbette's brunch. It, it's going to be a, a ball for drag queens, and it's, it's <laughs> going to be wonderful. <laughs> so we're going to honor Barbette. This is getting sticky again. I don't know if I'm pointing it at the wrong place. Nothing is moving. Oh, there we go. So, now we move on to Proust. So Man Ray said that his deathbed portrait of Proust was the toughest assignment he ever had, the most difficult. And it was, again, something that relates to Cocteau. Cocteau knew Proust, and Proust, of course, is the great French writer known for the remembrance of things past, this multi-volume novel that Cocteau is a character in. And so when he dies in 1922, this, this is a, a really an end of an era. This is a, a, a major moment in French literary life. And so for Man Ray to be given the honor of recording this deathbed po portrait, which will then be disseminated to newspapers and, the, and journals and the press, that was a big honor. But a tough assignment to take a portrait of someone who is no longer living. And I think what's really interesting with this is he, the way he went about it. Just trying to advance this. It's coming. <laughs> there we go. The way he went about it was to have a side view. Now, if you look at the anonymous photograph, um, this is a very different image. So we know that Man Ray wasn't the only person with a camera in that room. But I think what's interesting is Man Ray makes a number of decisions, and I think his photograph is so superior to the other one. Uh, first of all, from this photograph and others like it, you realize that people had gone to Proust's bed and laid flowers. Man Ray eliminates them. He wants this, it's almost like Proust is surrounded with a shroud, like a field of snow. And he captures this, this side view that gives it a power. There's almost like a, a hieratic, hieratic power, but he also captures the, the, the solemnity of this. this. This is a moment of mourning in a way that I, I almost feel the other one is almost like an intrusion. It, it, it's almost a photograph that shouldn't exist whereas Man Ray's portrait was the one that the family wanted to have taken. And when I look at it, I can't help but think that Man Ray was looking back to Nadar and his portrait of Victor Hugo, uh, which was from 1885, which was similarly the end of a moment in French literary life, uh, the end of an epoch. And I think there's something very similar, the play of light, the, the side view, and it's an interesting work because we now don't often see images of dead people. Um, and even if you set aside Cocteau's angel, this is the only one in the show. And I think it's incredibly poignant and beautiful. Um, and it brings up the question of Nadar because I do think that there is a relationship between Man Ray and Nadar. Nadar, of course, starts his career as a caricaturist and begins to use photography as a means of making those, those caricatures. And he had a pantheon. These were all the most interesting people of his time. And you can see there's hundreds of them. But he has to draw them. And so photography is almost like a sketch. It, it assists him. And then he has that moment where he's like, no, I'm doing this backwards. The photograph is the work of art. And so that's why we admire Nadar today. And you also have the, the fact that his real name was, was Felix Tunashon. So Nadar is like Man Ray. It's, it, it's like that unforgettable name. And so we took the pantheon as, as something to play with. What, it, what is Man Ray's pantheon? What does that look like? 
And what you see are the great writers and intellectuals. I showed you with Nadar, Rossini, but Nadar captures all of the composers, all of the writers, all of the artists who mean something in, in, in that time. And Man Ray's Paris Pantheon is very similar. You have James Joyce, uh, but it's an international avant-garde. You also have Fujita. And notice that the, the very spare simplicity, the fact that these people are placed against a burlap kind of background, uh, possibly even a, 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 a thin canvas weave that might have been used for painting. And it's them and them alone. There, there are no props. That there's none of the stiff formality of, of portrait photography at that time where you would choose like a, a cheesy background of, of the Alps or a, 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 you'd have a vase of flowers. All of that is gone. It is you and the camera. By the way, take a look at Fujita's knuckles. They're white knuckles. This, it, 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 there's something about Man Ray's all-seeing camera that is really making, this, this was something to be photographed. And with Joyce, of course, he, he had notoriously bad eyesight. And we know this session was very important. It was paid for by Sylvia Beach, um, who was the owner of Shakespeare and Company, who were publishing James Joyce's great novel, Ulysses, arguably the greatest novel of the 20th century. And they needed publicity images. Man Ray was the, the, the right person to do that. But the, the photography session had not been going well. It was long and arduous. And you had these very bright studio lamps. And here you see Joyce has just given his eyes a break. He's looked down. And Man Ray's got his shot. I, th I think he's really captured something very introspective and even slightly melancholy. And think about it. Most dust jackets of that time of a writer would have had books and a typewriter. Uh, it would have all the accoutrements and trappings of a literary career. Here, it's Joyce and his eyes and, and a backdrop. It, there's a stark simplicity to this. And I think you see that in this comparison. So here you have the aristocracy. And Man Ray, uh, through, through Cocteau again, was introduced to people like Count Etienne de Beaumont, who was known for his lavish balls. I'm going to take you to one of those later. Now, the Count lived in this amazing mansion uh, in Paris. And when Adolf de Meyer goes there, his decision is to show the Count surrounded by the opulence of his aristocratic mansion. Man Ray is the opposite. All of that is gone. It's the Count. So I think, I think one is really capturing the, the way the world sees someone like this Count. And I think Man Ray is trying to capture some inner essence of his sitter. I don't think Beaumont was ever photographed like that by anyone else, and he posed for all of the great photographers. And that brings me to Kiki. I mentioned her earlier. Um, you have to fall in love with Kiki in this exhibition. We have many photographs of her. I think this is my favorite because she's, this, she's a glamour puss, and she's surrounded with this incredible fur ruff, which I was delighted to see she probably wore. She was an artist model, and she probably wore for, for Kees van Dongen, who was a, a Dutch fauve painter. Uh, I think that's the same ruff and the same kind of approach, although she's, she's got that tough girl look. She's got the dangling cigarette. But I think what's interesting with, with Man Ray is he photographs his loved ones as much as he photographs the aristocrats or, or the, the writers. Um, it, it, he, can, he can do photographs with Kiki that he could probably not do with anyone else because she was such a, a skillful artist model. She knew how to pose. She knew what they were trying to achieve. And that's where I, when, when I said at the beginning, I, I feel like the subjects of his photographs need to get some credit for their role in the creative act. I think Kiki is at the forefront of that thinking. So what was it like to be photographed? Well, Lee Miller uh, provides the best accounts of what it was like. Lee Miller comes in 
to Man Ray's life at the end of the 20s. And you'll meet her in a minute. But she claimed, and I think it's true, that Man Ray was usually quite far away from his sitters, at somewhere between 10 and 13 feet. So he's not up in your face. You, when you look at a, a portrait like this, you think he might be right in your face. He's not. He's far away. And the first thing he's going to do is to make a very small contact print. So on this screen, this is enormous, but this is really three by two inches. It's, it's a tiny contact print. And many of these have his fingerprints on them because he kind of grabbed them when they, they were wet and he would draw on them. And what he's doing is indicating where to crop them and where to enlarge. So here you see, this is just graphite. And this is Elsie Houston, uh, who uh, was a singer from Brazil. She was an opera singer. And she was married to a, a surrealist poet called Benjamin Paré. And they visit her homeland in 1932. And when she comes back, she decides to, to sort of change career rather than being uh, a mezzo-soprano opera singer. She develops a nightclub act in which she sings Brazilian folk songs, Afro-Brazilian folk songs by candlelight. She would have like a ring of candles around her. And this is the perfect portrait. I, I, I really feel like this shows what happens because she showed up to this deck to the nines, right? But Man Ray eliminates this ring, this hand. I think he loved this play between the earring and, and the other ring, and he didn't need to have the other one. It was, it was a distraction. And then he blows it up so that she's almost like bursting through the screen. She's coming into our world. And when you do that, one thing that's really clear is things like blemishes and lines, uh, warts, moles, they really disappear. This is incredibly important if, if you are in the fashion industry. Imagine what that looks like. And, and what I would say to you when you're in the, the exhibition, look at the women who are in the film Emek Bakia, and there's often headshots, and you'll see every freckle, every line. Then go and see the portraits of those women, and they look like Elsie Houston. So one of the things that I think is, is very clear is Man Ray is not looking at other photographers. I think he's looking at painters when he makes his photographs. Uh, I think he's fully aware of the photographers of his day. Um, he did have a friendship with Stieglitz, and he certainly knew of the work of, of predecessors, people like Nadar and Atjeh, who was a neighbor. But I think he, where he took inspiration was his visits to the Louvre and his encounters with old master paintings. And in his writings, he particularly focuses on Veronese, on Holbein, on Vermeer, and above all, Rembrandt. And I love this juxtaposition because I think what you see is it's all about that central shaft of light, the cropping. Uh, I think what Man Ray is doing when he takes that contact print and enlarges it is he is really making a composition. So it's not so much the art of that kind of moment where he sees something he wants to photograph. It, a lot of it is manipulation. A lot is happening in the dark room. So many of these photographs have the addition of, of pencil, uh, of dabs of white in the eye. Um, underarm hair is always removed with a scalpel known as a Jenna. And there's a lot of, of manipulation, but you would never know that because it's so microscopic. So I think Rembrandt is very important. And when you think about Rembrandt, Rembrandt was amazing in that he also took as his principal models his loved ones, uh, his wife, his mistress, his family, and gave them the same billing as aristocrats, the same importance. And I think this comparison to me is very clear that Man Ray is looking back to him as an example of how you make a portrait and how you make it special. And finally, with, with 
this sequence of, of contact prints, I, I think this one is particularly instructive. This is Georges Braque, the great Cubist painter. And he was honored with a retrospective at the Kunsthaus Zurich. And a retrospective for an artist is such an important moment. It, it's when all of their paintings are brought together in one place. And Braque had, had been a pioneer of Cubism. Uh, he, this was a long overdue recognition. And Kaya Dar magazine, uh, which was Kriston Service's magazine, honors him with a special issue. And they commissioned Man Ray to make this photograph. And I love that Brock, who was a very humble guy, um, he wears a, a, a basically almost like a tuxedo and, and, a, and a, 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 a bow tie. This, this is like a very handsome, dapper Brock. This is not the Brock you normally see, who was the son of a house painter and often looks as if he's covered in paint. And so it means he dressed up. But what I love, that the, the thing that Man Ray did is, is he eliminated a lot of that suit. That's extraneous. He wants to fo focus on the face. But what he does is he also changes the orientation. So you look at this angle. In the final print, he's, he's kind of switched it, right? And Brock is looking down, and Man Ray makes him look up. It gives him an air of confidence and authority. And it's almost like one artist, Man Ray, to another artist, Brock, saying, this is your moment. Be confident. I'm, I'm going to give you the image that you deserve on, on this special occasion. And here's Lee Miller. So the photograph I just showed you is an example of solarization. Um, so this was a, a method that was actually uh, discovered by Lee Miller. And I say discover with kind of quotations around it because it had been known in the 19th century. Um, it had been actually described in a scientific journal uh, by a man called Sabatier. So it was known as the Sabatier effect. And um, Lee Miller was one night in Man Ray's darkroom. She was his darkroom assistant after Barony Sabat. So Barony Sabat switches from being a sculptor to a, a photographer. She, she works with Man Ray up until 1926 when she establishes her own studio and goes on to have her amazing career. Then Man Ray uh, hires uh, Jacques-André Boifard and has him as the studio assistant up until 1929 when the same thing happens. So th this is a, a, a moment in which these artists want to have their own, having learned from Man Ray, Man Ray the techniques of the trade, they want to have their own careers. So Lee Miller, you can see she's absolutely gorgeous, that the camera loves her. She was a fashion model, model, and she was in New York. She was very young, but she was very smart, and she realizes that the shelf life of a fashion model is very small, very short. And so she asked the photographer, Edward Steichen, how do I get on the other side of the camera? And Steichen says, you go to Paris and you study with Man Ray because he knew about Berenice Abbott and he knew about Boifard and he knew that Boifard had left. So Lee Miller shows up and uh, much to her surprise and, and, and dismay, Man Ray has, has left for vacation. But his housekeeper says he might be in a bar called the Drunken Boat. Now, don't we all want to go to the drunken boat? So she finds him. Like, this is, this is such an unbelievable story. And she, she finds him, and she says, hello, my name is Lee Miller, and I'm your new student. And I think Man Ray was really taken aback by that, and, and he kind of says, well, tough luck. I'm going on vacation. And she says, great, I'm coming too. And... It helped that she was stunningly good looking and she is the quintessential new, new woman. She knows what she wants, she's independent, uh, she's gonna have her career and she's driven, she's absolutely driven. She would wear baggy men's clothes, she, she would smoke and she would drive fast cars and, and she was gonna have, she was gonna live the life that she wanted to live. She wasn't gonna have men define that role for her. 
And that is part of the reason why she leaves Man Ray. Uh, they become lovers, but in 1932, she leaves him, and he's absolutely heartbroken. Um, he never, actually, I don't think he really quite gets over it. Um, you know, because he's a little guy, and she's like this glamorous model. Um, but I think what, what it really shows is men have been doing this for centuries, and she was just going to have her career, and she does go and have an amazing career. If you've ever seen her, she was the, the, the photographer who, who photographed the, the camps in, in World War II and dared her publishers and, and basically said, you must uh, reproduce these photographs. This is true. People need to know the stories. Now, so Lee Miller is, again, like Berenice Sabbath, an incredibly important photographer in her own right. She's a, mo a, a modern woman. But she's also, the, the, as I said, the discoverer of this solarization technique. And so one night, she's in the studio, and that there are some negatives in the development tray for a fashion assignment, and she feels a mouse run over her foot. She lets out a shriek, turns on the light, and what that does is it exposes the negatives, and it creates what Man Ray and, and Lee Miller called solarization. They did not know it was the Sabatier effect. Similarly, with Man Ray's rayographs that I described earlier, they're really photograms. People have been making them since the, the mid-19th century, but Man Ray didn't know that. And in both cases, I think with the rayograph and with solarization, he takes an existing technique, but he, he expands it. He takes it in new directions. No one ever made photographs like this. On the far side, I think you see that there's a kind of... A, a lineage here. The, the early solarized portraits play with that profile, and, and solarization essentially is a partial res reversal of tones. So it also gives uh, this amazing edging. So it's like the, the, the models and subjects are imbued with a, almost like an invisible source of energy. They're radiating. They've got a halo. And I think you see with Merritt Oppenheim in this beautiful print that, that was lent by the Museum of Modern Art, you, you get this kind of wonderful profile. It's, it's like an Italian Renaissance drawing. Then in Max Ernst, M Man Ray has perfected it to the point where it's no longer about the edging, it's about the ability to capture information. And you can see every line on that checkered suit. It, it, this is just a marvelous uh, portrait. So, so far, I've been describing what happens in Man Ray's studio. But there's also times when he goes out and about. Uh, I love these uh, images of cars. I, I think they take us back to a different moment in time. Um, Picabia, I mean, we, it's, we call this Francis Picabia in his Delage D.E. Tourer. But he's all the way back there. I mean, that <laughs> the, real, the real subject is this fantastic beast of a car. And similarly with, with Duran, what I love about this, this is a portrait that Man Ray describes at great length in his autobiography. This was the first car that could go more than 100 miles an hour, the first commercially built available car. Um, and it was blue. Um, you never know the colors of Man Ray's photographs, but we know that this was a blue Bugatti Type 43. And so Duran invites Man Ray to test it out. And look at the road. These are, these are cobblestones. So, so this, is, this is a bumpy ride. And the seats were like buckets. And they decide to drive from Paris to Fontainebleau and they take the car to 110 miles an hour. And Man Ray said it was like the, the wind was like chopping off his head, and they find this, this famed gastronomic inn, and they have the most incredible lunch with wine. And honestly, they knew how to live. The, 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 I love these photographs. And one thing you should remember also is the exchange rate was so favorable to Americans. And Man Ray, if he was selling his work to, a, to a, a fashion magazine like Vanity Fair, he would have been paid in dollars. So he, he was really living 
high, high on the hog, I think the expression is. Here's another pair of, of car photographs, and, and they've been really intriguing me lately. Uh, I don't know where they're taken. It, does, it, it seems to be further south than Paris, and I even speculate, because we know they were made in 1926, that this could have been Man Ray and Kiki driving to the south of France to Emek Bakia, which was the villa owned by Arthur and Rose Wheeler, where, where they film the, the, the film of the same title, Emmett Bakia. And I think it captures just the, the wonderful adventure of going on the road in those days. So Kiki is in the passenger seat, and I just really think that Man Ray pulled up at the side of the road. He probably noticed these two trees were a wonderful framing device with a, with a broad sky. And it captures his car, his, his Voisin C7. He was very proud of that car. Um, but what's interesting is this photograph, I'm wondering if Kiki took that. I don't think it's as good. <laughs> I think it's a bit more conventional. You've got the two trees. Look at how Man Ray kind of uses that edge. And then the, the viewpoint He's really, this, is, this seems like a Man Ray composition, whereas the other one seems almost, I hate to say it, almost like a photograph I would take. Um, but I think it's great. It captures that, that youthful spirit of, of two people in love out in the French countryside. And Man Ray was obsessed with cars. So one of the reasons that we were able to do this show was pre-COVID, I had been to the Getty, and I had read Man Ray's papers, his diaries, uh, and letters at the, at the Getty Research Center. And I was struck at the time by his doodles of cars. Some of them, like that seems like a real car from the 1920s. That seems like a car that we might build next year. <laughs> so he's, he's really got this imagination. And these are doodles, these are things that you know, he might be on the telephone and just making them. But I think, I think they, they show the importance of automobiles. And then another uh, place that he goes to is Saint-Jean-de-Luz, which is in, in southwest France, to photograph the architect Robert Mallet stevens who's just designed La Pogola, which is a, an amazing casino complex. It has a swimming pool. It, it has hotel rooms and, and this... It's a municipal casino, and it's a wonderful feat, really, of, of Art Deco architecture. And when we acquired this print, we hadn't really figured out where that was, but it was this Therese Bonnet photograph that really showed, here, here's the parking garage. This is actually the way you entered, and this is why it's called La Pergola. It's, it's this lattice work, and I love the way that Man Ray's done a kind of visual rhyme with, with the architect's kind of hands-on hip stance and that amazing beret. So naming and dating became really important for me and, and for Madeline as we were putting this exhibition together. Um, and also identifying people. This is a man called Harry Melville. And this photograph, I should say, uh, took a long time to unpack what on earth is going on? He, <laughs> he seems to be holding a piece of paper with these amazing hands in front of it, right? I mean, incredible. And, and, and so what we figured out is Man Ray was doing a series of advertisements for Pond's Hand and Vanishing Cream. <laughs> Harry, Harry Melville is a hand model. Look. Look at this portrait by Augustus John, who's in the show, uh, the Welsh painter. And you can see these incredibly distinctive fingers. And I, I wanted to include this tonight because Denise Bethel, who's a great friend of the museum and, and an authority on photography, uh, she asked me about this because some people have tried to argue that this is another person, uh, a man called Robert H. Greeley, but it, it cannot be. This, this is Melville. This is absolutely Harry Melville. Only one person in the world has fingers like that. And there are many other portraits that I could show you uh, where people have really gone to town on those fingers. 
But I think what Man Ray loved was that furtive kind of like the eyes peering over. Because ostensibly for the, the purpose of an advertisement, he would have cropped that out. But the fact that he made this into a print shows that, again, like Joyce, like Barony Sabbath, like Stravinsky, he kind of loves that chance, that accident, that moment in which the unexpected happens. That's magic to him. To so many other, other photographers, it, it would be what you throw away. But to Man Ray, that was where the gold was. And this is Marcel Duchamp. So <laughs> Alex mentioned earlier that I, I, have, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on Marcel Duchamp. Uh, I love his work and ideas. I, I think of him every day. Um, and I read, his, I read his notes. Um, so I, 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 I'm deep in that kind of Duchamp world. And this photograph ha has always bothered me because in, man, in the Mannery literature, it's always been dated 1917. And it cannot have been made in 1917. And the reason for this is that Duchamp sells, this is, this is a painting on glass. And he sells it to the couturier Jacques Doucet. And that happens in 1923. And Doucet wonders, how do you display a work on glass? And he commissions a, an amazing uh, French frame designer and book designer called Pierre Legrand. And Pierre Legrand comes up with this very elaborate frame. Um, and you can see it's actually a, it's a metal frame um, this is like a, a, the end of a propeller. And what it does, it allows the painting to sit flush against the wall, but then it can rotate out, and it's totally safe, it won't break. Duchamp's work is, he, he worked on glass, almost every piece on glass is broken except for this one, and it was the genius of Pierre Legrand's frame. But in the Getty, when I was reading um, Man Ray's notes and diaries, I came across an entry on December 21st, 1923, that just said, photo Marcel's glass, and it has to be that. Because that's when we know that Duchamp delivered the, the, the glider, which is what it's called, to Jacques Doucet and it entered his collection. And today it hangs at the Philadelphia Museum. But that kind of attention to detail, to redate this properly now to 1923, is what this show is all about. Another great story, I mean, Madeline and I had so much fun. We, we can't believe we get paid to do this. Um, look at this photograph. So this is, this is the Marchesa Cassati, who has, has gone to a ball, and, and this takes place at Count Etienne de Beaumont's mansion. And, and Clearly, you know, this is, this is the gardens here. And the invitation invited the guests to dress as famous paintings. So you could come as the Mona Lisa, you know, Holbein's ambassadors. But the Marchesa was someone who lived life to the, the limit. So she doesn't just come in, 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 a, in a gown. She commissions an artist called Christian Barrard to make a whole backdrop Look at this, this is enormous. So the first thing is to identify who is she coming as. That was pretty easy because of this painting by Winterhalter. And you notice in her hair, she has these, these kind of spangles, these stars, silver stars. They were actually made of, of silver foil. And that looks back to this famous portrait of Winterhalter. But what was obsessing us were those damn horses. <laughs> now, Elizabeth, Emp Empress of Austria, she was known as Sisi, and she was a great equestrian. So it was no surprise to have horses behind her. Except, why would you do that? Why would you make this enormous backdrop? And finally, we had our answer that the Museum Ludwig in Germany did a show on CC, and we got in touch with their curator, Miriam Zwast, and we were trying to find out the identity of these horses. And we read in the Tatler magazine, which first published this, that their names were Flick and Flock. 
And then we, we hit the lottery and we found this painting, which has the names of the horses on the frame and their kind of side view portrait and the rearing horses. No one has ever put this all together. And so th there are some days, there are some days that are so frustrated because you, you have dead ends, right, in research. But this was a great day. This, this was a champagne day. So Man Ray, as I said earlier, he, he has this amazing income because he gets paid for his portraits. And Berenice Abbott remembers that in 1925, he was charging 1,000 francs per photograph, which was a lot of money. But then he had the ability to sell it to magazines and newspapers. And that could be a second source of income. And Vanity Fair is, is the magazine right at the beginning when he's first in Paris. Frank Cronenshield was the editor, and he would visit Man Ray's studio and look at his portraits. And they had this series called We Nominate for the Hall of Fame. So here you see Augustus John, who did that fabulous painting of, of Harry Melville's hands called The Mask. And Augustus John was a Welsh artist. He was a bohemian rebel, and he shows up drunk. And you can kind of see it. He's kind of slouched down, and he, he's in his cups, as they say. So he, when, when Man Ray showed him the print, he actually tore it up, he, and, and he thought that was the end of it. But Man Ray made another print and showed it to, to Frank Crowninshield, who, who said, it's wonderful. It, it's so, such a powerful image. And he reproduces it in Vanity Fair. And so Man Ray, no one in 1923 is having an exhibition of Man Ray photographs. But people know him, and especially as time goes on, because of, of the, the wide dissemination of his works through books and magazines. Um, someone like this image of Picasso was endlessly reproduced in the 1920s. I mean, magazine after magazine, I mean, this is a, a, a story uh, on artist studios. And, of course, you need to have an image of, pa of Picasso. So Man Ray was able to become very famous for, for these works. And that encourages other people, when they see how great his portraits are, they come to his studio. But it wasn't just commissions. Many of the portraits were commissioned. But some were actually made by Man Ray if he wanted to illustrate an idea. And this is Prudhoe Pilar. And I would say Prudhoe Pilar is why we have the Spanish labels, because we fell in love with her. She's a Spanish flamenco dancer. And she shows up in Man Ray's studio. And he takes two iconic photographs. Um, one, she's dancing the flamenco, almost like Loie Fuller. She's, she is the, the, the velocity of this image. This image is, is known as the fixed explosive. And it is like a rocket taking off. She, she is absolutely lost in the dance. And look at, she's like the bull, right? She, she's really into it. But then at the end of the dance, she's expended all that energy and she's collapsed on the floor. So Man Ray had this idea for his own article that he publishes in Minotaur, that it's called Dance Horizons. And what that means is to him, a true dance is only over when you're on the floor. So in, in other words, people have got it wrong. You know, people are, are, are doing these wonderful, you know, waltzes and, 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 you know, Charlestons. But to him, that was a dance. And, and he just, he, compares her to, to a red-hot chili pepper. Um, so I think this was Man Ray doing his own work. And by the way, André Breton, um, in the same issue of, of Minotaur, uh, reproduces the fixed explosive as an idea of, of, of convulsive beauty. That's a very important surrealist concept. Um, and I think what happens when you see both of them is you see two sides of, of this argument. One is that amazing kind of Dionysian moment. And then the other is the moment in repose, and I just love her smile. 
And so when, when we saw that and we started to notice the number of Spanish um, and also uh, South American um, people in the show, sitters in the show, and we started to think about the cultural and linguistic diversity of Virginia, that's when we decided to have Spanish labels, uh, a Spanish audio guide and a Spanish brochure as well as the English ones. This is arguably Man Ray's, I won't say his most important, but probably his most celebrated subject. Uh, and there's a huge story behind here that might end up being a different, another book. Um, this, of course, is Wallace Simpson. She was an American living in, in London. She was married to uh, Ernest Simpson, who was an Anglo-American shipping magnate. And she was having an affair with the, with the Prince of Wales, who then becomes uh, King Edward VIII. And what happens at that moment is a constitutional crisis. Edward declares his love for her, and he intends to marry her. He intends to marry this divorced American. She's already been divorced once. She would have to get divorced again. So Buckingham Palace establishes a ruse to get Wallace out of the country so the king can meet with Ernest and ask him to divorce his wife. It doesn't quite work out that way. But the ruse that's hatched is that they make a fake assignment and she has to go to Man Ray's studio to be photographed. And, and this is what you see. Ernest Simpson does agree uh, to divorce Wallace, and, uh, but as, as you know, the king has to abdicate. And so she becomes the Duchess of Windsor, he becomes the Duke of Windsor, and they live in exile. That's another story. But what's fascinating to me is when the scandal breaks, in December 1936, it's Man Ray who's made the most recent photographs. And this is an international story. So for the wonders of eBay, Ma Madeline found this Czech magazine. That's our, that's our photograph right there. Um, and, and there's just so many others. This, by the way, um, this, is, this was so scandalous because a commoner cannot put their hand on the King of England. Um, and then I think what's great also is Man Ray, everyone was betraying Wallace. Everyone who ever met her was like, oh, I can tell you about her, and they were, they were dishing gossip. But remember, Man Ray actually did meet her and took a series of photographs. So uh, the New York Herald Tribune interviews him and, and says, you know, tell us more about this, this Wallace Simpson. What was she like? And he said, she was but one of many beautiful women that I photographed. And the reporter just kept pushing and pushing. And they said, Man Ray fell into a clam-like silence. He would not betray the confidence. And I really admire him for that. This, of course, is, is the uh, British writer Virginia Woolf. And what's amazing about this photograph um, is she's wearing lipstick at Man Ray's request. Now, Virginia Woolf, of course, is a feminist writer, and she doesn't wear lipstick as a matter of course. But Man Ray said, you need to because the light will, will shine on it and it will look better in, in the photograph. And I think he's right. You know, the, the, the light just hits that top of her lip. And what he, what, what's funny about this story is when she left after the session, he offered her a rag to wipe the lipstick off and she, she said no and she, she walked out. She rather liked that lipstick. And it, it appear, this photograph appears on, on the cover of, of Time in 1937 uh, after Virginia Woolf publishes her final uh, novel. And by then, Man Ray is starting to chafe at this life of, of portrait commissions. Um, he actually publishes a, a polemical uh, book. I say it's a book, it's more of, of, of like a pamphlet or a portfolio called Photography is Not Art. And this, of course, had been one of the great debates of the early 20th century. Is photography art? Um, and there were painters and sculptors who just felt that anyone can pick up a camera, 
but if to, to paint something with a paintbrush, you've got to have training. So photography was denigrated. Man Ray was one of the, the great artists who made photography into an art form. So it was incredible that he should denounce it. And of course, you have to remember he's a surrealist, so it, he's not entirely being serious when he does that. And there was also a column that Man Ray was interviewed for, and, and all of the great um, artists working, all the photographers working in Paris, and it was called Photography is Not Art. So I think there, there, there's a lot going on here to unpack. My argument in the catalog and the exhibition is Man Ray undoes his own argument by including in this portfolio this amazing portrait of Miriam Hopkins, who was a, an American actress. She was kind of the Reese Witherspoon of her day, and she was not taken seriously. She was, she was, Hollywood portrayed her as the ditzy blonde, and she would be like holding a telephone as if she didn't know how to use it. And Man Ray gives her that amazing image, that, that cropped image. You, you see her eyes, she's looking up. This is a serious actress, you know, and I think that's, again, Man Ray is, is delivering on this promise that these self-fashioning men and women who want to create their identities, who want to, to, to live their best lives and be seen in a serious way, he's delivering the image that they, they want. Everyone who, who, who sat for him would always say, you know, it was such an amazing experience. And remember, someone like Miriam Hopkins you know, we don't know her today. Part of this show is reclaiming these people and, and revisiting them. Um, but they were definitely reinventing themselves. And one thing I should say is it, it really strikes me that Man Ray went to Paris right after the Span Spanish influenza pandemic. And there's a reason why people are in Paris and reinventing themselves. Someone like Kiki de Montparnasse was not born that way. She was born Alice Prynne. You know, but Kiki de Montparnasse sure sounds better. <laughs> so I mentioned surrealism. Uh, you know, Man Ray was really the official photographer of surrealism. Uh, he made portraits of, of every member of the group and really stunning portraits that are on view in the exhibition. It's one of the largest galleries. And I think also he really understood that photography could play a role uh, Breton would use his photographs to, to illustrate his novels. And photography, like painting, like objects, could really try to kind of show in visual terms what the Surrealists were all about. You know, embracing the irrational, celebrating the marvelous, tapping into the unconscious. Look at this, this image called Dreams. And Dreams were so important to the Surrealists. You know, they looked back to Sigmund Freud and the interpretation of dreams. But they really believed that in our dreaming state, we are truly free. There are no laws. There are no rules. You, you can drive a Bugatti at 200 miles an hour. You're never going to get a speeding ticket. And so that freedom that we have in our dream state, they wanted to reconcile with our waking state. And they wanted to live life without rules, without limits, and, and do something marvelous. That, that, this is an image that I think really is about that convulsive beauty that Breton spoke about. And then we, that brings this work into play. Um, I love this. This, this is a, a, a work that's been loaned by Bowdoin College Museum. And we had to have it at the end of the show. Uh, but I think its significance has become even more important now that the show is open and I've started to really look at it. Um, in, in, and look at it, I say that, in a, look at it in a different way. When you, when you see exhibitions, new things pop into your mind. So when we borrowed it, I, I love the fact that the contemporary photographer, Ellen Carey, had discovered Man Ray's signature. So you can kind of see what's happened. He's got a pen light. And he is, he's whirling it. He's, he's kind of making these, these wonderful gestures of light. And he's essentially hidden behind this, this kind of matrix. It's like a Jackson Pollock painting. Uh, and it does make you think of, of that portrait of Marcel Duchamp earlier where he was behind his glass. So Ellen 
uh, Kerry discovered that if you look at this in a mirror, you can actually find Man Ray's signature, which I think is very telling. It makes it a, a self-portrait, and it is a self-portrait. And we call it self-portrait with space writing. But it's always been dated to 1935, and this cannot be. And the reason is this photograph, this, this kind of uh, smaller contact print, shows what's really going on. Man Ray is seated at a chess board. He's got a kind of frame that's going to tell him where he is when he's doing his kind of amazing automatist doodles. But look on the wall behind him. There's a small painting called Return to Reason. That was made in 1921, right when he comes. But look at this enormous painting next to him. It's the same painting. He makes a, an enlarged version of Return to Reason in 1939. This quintessentially dates this work to 1939. But it's even more important because when you think about it, return to reason, you're in 1939, you're, you've got the, the clouds of war are gathering over Europe. This is a time of conflict. And that made me think the other day about another work that you see here, this. This is a, a, a sculpture by Alberto Giacometti and it's called Court Hand. Now, what you have to remember about Man Ray is when he goes to Paris, his name, Man, means hand. So court hand means he's caught. And that entanglement of that hand put together with those paintings called Return to Reason really makes me think that this is an artist who's trapped. He's Jewish, he's a modern artist, he's an outspoken anti-fascist, his life is imperiled. This, I think, until I saw this, this photograph really in the galleries and thought deeper about it, it really makes me realize just how Man Ray felt at the time. He felt in, that his life was in danger and he wanted to show, and in a way, it's almost like the self-portrait in there is telling us that his, his identity is slipping away, that he actually, is, is fearing for his life and his identity. And for good reason, um, many of, of the subjects in the show do end up being arrested by the Gestapo and sent to death camps. Um, we lose someone like Matt Chacob and, and Sonia Mosse. Uh, Matt Chacob uh, died at the Drancy internment camp two days before he was about to be put on a train to Auschwitz. Uh, Sonia Marseille, Marse, who was an artist and a singer um, at the lesbian cap, uh, cabaret Le Capricorn, she was someone who was murdered in a gas chamber in Czechoslovakia. And then you have uh, Robert Desnos, who survives the war. His camp is liberated and he dies of typhoid fever. And then finally, Rose Wheeler, and we've really been proud of the work that we've done on her. No one really knew anything about Rose Wheeler. She's in every Man Ray book because she's in Emmett Bakia. She's an actress. She's married to Arthur Wheeler. But we found out her identity. Uh, she was Rose Kurtzman, and she dies in very mysterious circumstances in 1940, and I think she was almost certainly a victim of, of the German invasion of France and this, this turning on the Jewish population. So I don't want to end on that note, even though I do think it's a poignant end to the show. I want to end on what I think is, is really the most important discovery of the show, which is the life and work of, of an African-American entertainer called Ruby Richards. And we were so blessed to come into contact with Ruby Richards' family uh, Aliyah Bay, Akila Bay, and Hakim Bay, who live in Houston, Texas, have really been partners in, in this adventure. So the long story short is that Josephine Baker retires from the Folie Berger in 1937. She marries a French businessman and is no longer going to perform. So the Folie Berger has a problem. They have been selling out night after night They've lost their headlining star, and they find Ruby. Uh, Ruby is, at that time, a dancer at the Cotton Club in Harlem. 
And they bring her to Paris, but no one knows her. And it's Man Ray who is tasked with introducing her to French audiences. And just look at how amazing these images are. Uh, you've probably noticed that they are uh, double exposure. Uh, and it's probably a technique called a negative sandwich, where you have two negatives developed together. But what it gives you is the chance to see Ruby in profile and head on. And in this case, you can see her, her head just slipping into that frame at the top. And she's wearing all those diamonds and feathers and sequins. She had amazing outfits. And I think they were inspired by her family. She, her family was from St. Kitts. In, in the British West Indies, and she moved to the United States to Harlem when she was two. Um, and I think that carnival tradition, which is called Sugar Mass in, in St. Kitts, sort of stayed with her with some of these really elaborate costumes. And I have to credit the work of a number of art historians, uh, people like Wendy Grossman, who has worked on, on Adrienne Fidelin, um, known as Addy, who was Man Ray's partner at the end of the 30s, uh, who he leaves behind when he goes back to America uh, to escape World War II, and she wouldn't go with him, but he always, he, Man Ray and his family would send provisions and, and care packages throughout World War II. Uh, Addy looked after his, his art when he was away. And this photograph um, is very important because this was the first time that a black model had been reproduced in an American fashion magazine when it was published in Harper's Bazaar in 1937. So it broke a, a color barrier. And just look at that lovely image of, of Man Ray looking adoringly at, at her. And she was so beautiful. And this was the tragedy of World War II. If it hadn't have happened, she, he may have stayed with her. Um, so I think people like Wendy Grossman and Denise Morel really laid the groundwork for what it is to discover someone like Ruby Richards and tell their story. This show is all about storytelling. And Ruby is someone who, uh, you know, here you see in the, that, I mentioned that carnival tradition, that amazing headdress. And sadly, of course, she's only a performer at the Folie Bergère for, for like a year because World War II breaks out. She has to come back. She does have a, she goes back to Paris after World War II, but she, she's, it's like her career has been interrupted. And it means she doesn't attain the success of someone like Josephine Baker. And she ends her career really as a recording artist. And we have wonderful songs playing in the galleries. Uh, she's got a beautiful voice. And, and we play this album, ZZ de Paris. Um, I even wonder if Man Ray took that photograph on the cover. Um, there's more research to be done on that. But we, when we were installing this show, our exhibition galleries are soundproofed, so we could pump up the volume, and we were dancing. You cannot listen. It, it's that kind of cha-cha-cha music. You cannot stop but tap your feet. And I want to end with this image, because what happens when you reclaim someone like Ruby Richards is everything falls into place. And what I mean by that is this is a painting that Man Ray made of Ruby Richards in 1954. They, they connected after World War II. And it was sold at Sotheby's uh, a while ago as a portrait of Ruby D. And it is not Ruby D, it is Ruby Richards. And that is but one of many discoveries that we've made. On February 3rd for Black History Month, we're going to have an evening celebrating Ruby Richards. And her family are going to come, and we're really hoping that they're going to share their memories. And I think it's just such a great way to honor uh, Ruby's life, which really was an extraordinary life, and we're learning more almost every day. Um, the family came to the opening and, and brought new information. Uh, they told me about the love of her life. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I would have loved to have known that before we did the catalog. <laughs> but. It's also a chance for Madeline and myself to really keep going and do more research because we're absolutely ferocious. When we get information, we dig, we go to the archives, we find out more. So I think I want to end with these amazing photographs and thank you for listening. I do hope you enjoy the exhibition. Thank you. Thank you.